Rock and Learn. The respiratory system allows oxygen into the blood and lets carbon dioxide leave the blood. That sounds simple enough. But let's go through all the parts of the respiratory system so we can understand how it works. This large muscle attached to the lungs is called the diaphragm. When it contracts, the lungs pull in air and you take a breath. Air enters through the nose into the nasal cavity. As it flows through the nasal passages, the air gets filtered, warmed, and moistened. Mucus along these passages traps dust and particles in the air to clean it before it gets to the lungs. After the nasal passages, the air travels past the larynx, or voice box. Then the air moves down the trachea, or windpipe. The trachea joins the upper respiratory tract to the lungs. If you gently touch the front of your throat, you can feel the trachea. Nice, Marco. Your description of the upper respiratory system is like a breath of fresh air. But let me tell you what happens once the air gets into the lungs. At the bottom of the trachea are two large tubes. These tubes are called the main stem bronchi. One goes into the left lung and the other goes into the right lung. Each main stem bronchus then branches off into tubes, or bronchi. They get smaller and smaller, like branches on a tree. The tiniest tubes are called bronchioles, and there are about 30,000 of them in each lung. Each bronchiole is about the same thickness as a hair. At the end of each bronchiole is a special area that leads into clumps of tiny air sacs called alveoli. There are about 500 million alveoli in your lungs. Each alveolus has a net-like covering of small blood vessels called capillaries. These capillaries are so tiny that the cells in your blood need to line up single file just to get through them. Whoa, capillaries are really tiny. Yes, they are. The alveolus is the pickup place for oxygen, which the cells in your body need to work. And they're also the drop-off place for carbon dioxide, which is a waste product from your cells. Hey, that's the exact opposite of what plants do. Smart boy, I like it the way you think. Your lungs are important for breathing, but they are also important for talking, which I just love to do. We know, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> Above the trachea is the larynx, or voice box. Across the voice box are two pieces of tissue called vocal cords. When the vocal cords are open, air flows through freely. When they partially close, as you exhale, they vibrate to make sounds. Oh. Hey, that's pretty cool. Sounds like your tummy wants to talk. <laughs> I guess I'm a little hungry. Perfecto! Let's talk about the digestive system while you eat this orange. We'll talk about where that orange will travel as it makes its way through your digestive system. Your body actually gets ready for digestion before you eat. Just seeing or smelling food creates saliva or spit in your mouth. When you eat food, the saliva breaks down the chemicals in the food a little. Your tongue helps out too, pushing the food around while you chew with your teeth. When you're ready to swallow, the tongue pushes the mushed up food toward the back of your throat and into the opening of your esophagus, the second part of the digestive tract. The esophagus is a stretchy pipe that's about 10 inches long. It moves food from the back of your throat to your stomach. When you swallow, a special flap called the epiglottis flops down over the opening of your windpipe to make sure the food enters the esophagus and not the windpipe. Muscles in the walls of the esophagus move in a wavy motion to slowly squeeze the food through the esophagus. This takes about two or three seconds. Your stomach is attached to the end of the esophagus. It's a stretchy sack shaped sort of like the letter J. It has three important jobs. To store the food you've eaten, to break down the food into a pulpy liquid mixture, 
and to slowly empty that liquid mixture into the small intestine. The stomach is like a mixer, churning and mashing together all the small balls of food that come down the esophagus into smaller and smaller pieces. It does this with help from the strong muscles in the walls of the stomach and gastric juices that also come from the stomach's walls. In addition to breaking down food, gastric juices also help kill bacteria that might be in the food. This small intestine is a long tube with about a one inch diameter. It's packed inside you beneath your stomach. An adult small intestine is about 22 feet long. The small intestine breaks down the food mixture even more, so your body can absorb all the vitamins, minerals, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. The small intestine can help extract these nutrients with a little help from the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. Those organs send different fluids to the first part of the small intestine. These juices help to digest food and allow the body to absorb nutrients. The pancreas makes enzymes that help the body digest fats and protein. A fluid from the liver, called bile, helps to absorb fats into the bloodstream. And the gallbladder serves as a warehouse for bile, storing it until the body needs it. Food may spend as long as four hours in the small intestine. During that time, the food becomes a very thin, watery mixture. Nutrients in the food are absorbed into the blood and go to the liver. The leftover waste, or the part of the food your body can't use, goes on to the large intestine. The nutrient-rich blood comes directly to the liver for processing. The liver filters out harmful substances or wastes and turns some of the waste into more bile. The liver even helps figure out how many nutrients will go to the rest of the body and how many will stay behind in storage. For example, the liver can store certain vitamins and a type of sugar your body uses for energy. At about 2.5 inches across, the large intestine is thicker than the small intestine and it's almost the last stop on the digestive tract. Like the small intestine, it is packed into the body and would measure 5 feet long if you spread it out. Let's not try that! <laughs> The waste passes through the part of the large intestine called the colon, which is where the body gets its last chance to absorb the water and some minerals into the blood. As the water leaves the waste product, what's left gets smaller and harder as it keeps moving along until it becomes a solid. The large intestine pushes the waste into the rectum, the very last stop on the digestive tract. The solid waste stays here until you are ready to push it out. Wow, that's a lot of information to learn. I think I can make it a little easier to digest. <laughs> Let's go. The alimentary canal? That's another name for the digestive system. I'm not so sure about this. Don't worry, it'll be fun. And here's some music you can really sink your teeth into. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Rockin' Molars. Yeah! Let's travel through the alimentary canal and learn about digestion now. Into your mouth you put your food. Your tongue pushes it back after it is chewed. The epiglottis comes next for us. It helps food go down the esophagus. And not down the windpipe. <laughs> <laughs> next comes the stomach. The food goes in and is broken down before the small intestine. The blood picks up some nutrients there and takes them to the liver to store and share. Yeah! Awesome! Then comes the large intestine for waste accumulation. It takes out more water and gets things ready for defecation. Waste moves through the colon, getting hotter as it flows. Till finally out of the rectum it goes. 
Not finished yet. 